and welcome to another episode of the Carolyn Glick Show. I'm filming today from Chicago. I'll be in the States and in Toronto this week um, and back in Israel for another episode next week. But uh, for now, I'm here uh, stateside and uh, North America side, uh, for that matter, for a week. Um, and uh, a lot of strategic developments this week. Uh, regionally, President Biden landed in Ukraine for a surprise visit on Monday, which is when I'm taping. Uh, met with Zelensky. Um, uh, Iran uh, allowed a IAEA, uh, International Atomic Energy Agency inspector, to uh, see that they have enriched uranium to 84% uh, purity, which is basically weapons grade, which is 90%. So Iran decided this week to tell the world that uh, they are effectively a nuclear power. Um, and that's going to, of course, uh, cause. Um, uh, some significant developments in the future. So my guest today is my friend and colleague from Asia Times, David Goldman. He's been on before to talk about it. His analysis of Ukraine from the outset was prescient and as as we see today, uh, correct. Um, and so we're going to talk about those strategic developments. But before I turn it over to the conversation uh, with David, um, this day, today, uh, the 21st of February, uh, 2023, the uh, Rosh Chodesh of the, the first of the month of Adar in the Jewish calendar is a historic day in Israel. The Knesset passed uh, first reading of uh, two laws on judicial reform uh, in the Knesset. And with their passage, they'll start negotiating in a significant way with any opposition members who are willing to sit down and acknowledge the legitimacy of both the election results and of the legislative process. Um, but I think we have to just sit back for a second and relish this day because it's historic. Today was the first day in Israel's history where the right has actually taken steps to assert governing power away and, and rest it away from our entrenched bureaucracy, Israel's deep state, much more powerful uh, than the American deep state, even as, um, I mean, in terms of its power nationally. Um, and uh, this is the first step that's ever been taken by a right-wing government to wrest power away and give the power to determine the course of the Jewish state to the elected officials, to the elected leaders of the Jewish state in the Knesset and the government. This is a really big deal. Menachem Begin got a lot of flack, and rightly, I think, from uh, his uh, his supporters on the right in the Likud, both during his premiership and then afterwards, uh, and in subsequent years and decades since uh, Begin took power, which was that he, after 29 years in the political wilderness, he finally took power, but he turned around and let all of the uh, bureaucrats in uh, Israel's permanent government remain in, pa remain in power, uh, whether it was in the legal fraternity or the most prominent example was in the state uh, media. Um, he never seized governing authority. He never, uh, he never brought in his own people to run the government. He always let the other side do it. And I think that when you you look at it, you can see that it was a mistake, but you can also see why he did it. Begin didn't have problems uh, with the fact that the Israeli elites opposed him. He was used to it. I mean, that had been the case since well before the founding of Israel in 1948. Um, but uh, on the other hand, in 1977, the left was still Zionist. It was patriotic. It, it was loyal. And so they might have wanted Begin not to be in power, but they didn't they weren't going to do anything to undermine Israel and Israel's national security. That isn't the case anymore. Uh, over the intervening 40 years since then, um, the left in Israel has become increasingly radicalized and anti-Zionist, or at least post-Zionist, and the fulcrum of that radicalization has been the Supreme Court of Israel. Um, through the judicial revolution, that uh, the uh, former president of the Supreme Court, Aaron Barak, enacted uh, between 1992 and 1995, when the Supreme Court seized for itself, arrogated the power to overturn Knesset laws, and then in subsequent years seized more and more governing powers from the government 
and legislative powers from the Knesset and accept no limits on its powers that it had arrogated it to itself without legal basis, um, that process of arrogating the powers of Israel's elected officials uh, also engendered a radicalization of the courts. By ending standing requirements in the courts, Barack invited what became a cottage industry of non-governmental organizations that were formed, uh, political organizations operating under the aegis of human rights to undermine government policies, to undermine Jewish uh, uh, sovereignty, uh, Israel's, Israel's identity as a Jewish state, and a whole host of domestic and strategic issues. Um, and those NGOs are funded in large measure by foreign governments who the largely from Europe, but also from the United States, also the United States that are engaged in a political war against Jewish statehood, Jewish nationalhood, J Jewish nation, Jewish nationalism and um, Zionism. And uh, so a report that just came out from Im Tertsu, uh, which is a uh, nationalist a Zionist student organization in Israel, they uh, just published a report that was uh, covered uh, by Channel 14 News. And what they found was the depth of foreign funding of the self-proclaimed civil rights or human rights organizations that have petitioned the court hundreds of times every year. Um, and so what they found was that the funding of these organizations from 2017 to 2022, uh, just for, I think it was uh, 32 organizations, uh, it reached 300 million shekels. That's nearly $100 million of foreign government money that went into these organizations to undermine, to gum up the works, as one of them referred to it, of the Israeli government by petitioning the court against every national security decision effectively that the that the government made, that the army is makes, uh, laws that the Knesset passes that ex expand or protect and to preserve Israel's Jewish identity. So these foreign governments are hiding behind these NGOs that were founded because the Supreme Court effectively invited them to begin operations when it lowered or eliminated standard, uh, I mean, standing requirements to petition the Supreme Court. So as the Supreme Court radicalized Israel's deep state, our permanent bureaucracy, our permanent government, through the uh, everything is justiciable uh, concept banner, um, the requirement of actually limiting the powers of the Supreme Court, of reigning in Israel's legal fraternity, which until tonight had limitless powers, became more and more apparent and more and more urgent uh, for Israel to survive in the long term as the Jewish state and as a democracy, which has separation of powers and it's where people go to the ballot and they elect people to lead the country in line with their values and the nation's interests. So as the left radicalized more and more, the permanent bureaucracy, which is dominated and has been dominated by the left since the founding of Israel became more and more radicalized. And it was only because of the radicalization, not because they opposed Likud, because of the radicalization of the left and of the left inside of the permanent state of Israel that the requirement to actually rein them in through reform became so pressing. And what we saw today was the first step towards reforming a system that has been screaming out for reform and placement of limits on its power. Now, I would say for decades, I've been writing about the issue of the Supreme Court and of the, the legal fraternity, our attorney general, which also has unlimited power for 20 years or more. And um, so for me, it's a very sweet victory. And one last thing I want to say about that, um, we still have a long road ahead of us before the counter-revolution, if you will, if the democratic restoration of Israel is to go forward. We have a lot of obstacles in, in our path, but for me and for many, many other Israelis who have been working for this for decades, uh, this is a moment to relish. 
And just to give you a sense of the stakes. So this morning, the day started in Israel uh, with anarchists who were aping Antifa, many of them wearing and, you know, wear Antifa masks, uh, not this morning, but in other uh, actions that they have taken, barricading the doors of uh, Tali Gottlieb, uh, Likud, a member of Knesset, an outspoken champion of judicial reform, a trial lawyer herself until she was elected, criminal uh, a criminal defense attorney, and uh, education minister Yoav Kish. Both of them live in apartment buildings. The leftist agitators entered their buildings, sat down in the hallways of their of floors in the, you know, outside the door of their apartments, inside of their apartment building, and tried to block them from being able to leave their homes and go to the Knesset to vote this morning. And in the case of Tali Gottlieb, she has a special needs daughter, um, who's very, very uh, low functioning, um, and they terrified her. Uh, the mother, Tali Gottlieb, who is a lawmaker, but she's also a mother, was pleading with them to leave and they refused and effectively said that she was under house arrest. Um, we had member of Knesset Ram Ben Barak uh, for the second time now uh, comparing the government and the Knesset to Nazi Germany um, and on and on and on uh, in terms of the provocations. Ehud Barak, uh, former prime minister and chief of staff of the army of uh, almost all but openly calling for uh, violence against Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, in a tweet, um, you know, and and this is just the kinds of things that we're facing now in Israel. The left is truly out of control. The radical left is out of control, and unfortunately, the political leaders of the left, Yair Lapid, Benny Gantz, and others, are either part of the mob or too afraid of the mob to stand up to them. So they're not standing with. President uh, Yitzhak Herzog, who is also a leftist, but unlike uh, the Knesset leaders, uh, at least right now, for now, is not paralyzed by fear of the mob, and he's trying to reach compromise. And so, you know, we're seeing we're seeing um, a fight. We saw this this evening in the Knesset. It was met, and that the elected government and Knesset stood up to the mob for their part, and pass through the beginning of a long process of legal reform in Israel that is years overdue, decades overdue. It's finally being done because it must be done, it must be done. And we're blessed to be led today by men and women who are courageous, who are willing to stand up, who understand the stakes and are not standing down. And we should wish them Godspeed as they continue this. They deserve all of our support. Everybody who loves democracy, everybody who wants to preserve Israel as a Jewish state should be applauding their courage and their efforts and should be cheering them on as they go forward through compromise and also through stubborn insistence to see this work through. It is the most important thing on the agenda uh, domestically. It influences everything that we do abroad, um, which as we're gonna turn to now with David uh, uh, Goldman, uh, it's clear that the stakes are rising by the day also outside of Israel's gates because of the, not only the regional situation with Iran, but also because of the global situation, uh, which is reflected so strongly by the bitter strategic realities unfolding in Ukraine today a year after the Russian invasion. But for Israelis, this is a moment to savor. And uh, for friends of Israel, this is a moment to savor and celebrate. So a little bit of good news. And now um, I'm gonna move to my interview with David Goldman and talk about the realities that Israel faces as we restore our democracy and preserve our Jewish identity and our democracy uh, for the generations to come. All right, so a year ago this week, Russia invaded Ukraine. And uh, in many ways, the world has changed a lot as a result of that uh, act. The war slogs on. Um, and I think it's time, a year in, uh, 
to take to assess what has happened over the past year, what's happened with Ukraine, what's happened with the United States and its position in the world, what's happened with Russia, and how all of this impacts Israel and Iran and the Middle East. Um, and I could think of nobody better to talk about this with than my friend and esteemed colleague, David Goldman uh, from the Asia Times and uh, many other places. Um, uh, so first of all, welcome David back to the Carolyn Glick Show. Carolyn, it's always a pleasure and privilege. Thank you for inviting me. Well, thanks again for, for coming here. You know, we spoke, I think about it, uh, several months ago, or probably maybe even six months ago about uh, Russia's invasion of, uh, of Ukraine and U.S. policy regarding um, Russia and Ukraine. The United States to date, I think, have they given $300 billion in uh, in assistance to Ukraine? Is that right? Something like that? $100 billion? No, it's through... it's more like $100. $100 billion. And, and, billion. and today uh, in, in Ukraine, President Biden pledged another half billion uh, dollars in aid to Ukraine. Israel's foreign minister, Eli Cohen, was in Ukraine last week, and he uh, he promised uh, loan guarantees for various things to Ukraine and also uh, committed Israel to helping uh, Ukraine with uh, uh, anti-missile shield. Uh, I think uh, David Slink was the one that he was talking about providing uh, Ukraine. Um, and you have all of the nations in NATO that are now anteing up and sending over a few tanks here, how it serves, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so when we talked about it, uh, you were, I think, one of the only people who was really pointing out uh, the problems with uh, what the United States was doing in Ukraine, uh, both in terms of a strategy for winning the war and also for what it meant with uh, U.S. and U.S. power projection and, and America's reputation as, a, uh, as an ally in the world. So let's talk a little bit about where we are today. Uh, first of all, how do you assess the situation on the ground in, in Ukraine? Let's just start from there. It's a brutal and sustained war of attrition. Both sides have probably lost between 100 and 150,000 killed and considerably more wounded. 150,000 uh, killed in total or 300,000? No. Uh, between 200 and 300,000 killed in the year of war, which is you know, a pretty big total. We lost, what, 70,000 people in Vietnam over 10 years. So this is a, this is a lot of deaths. We lost 5,000 killed in Iraq and Afghanistan, roughly. So in a short period of time, this is a massive amount of casualties. Uh, contrary to what the U.S. government stated forcefully at the outset of the war, that the Russian economy would collapse under the weight of sanctions, it has done no such thing. Russian economy has uh, perhaps lost 1% or 2% this year and is expected by the International Monetary Fund to grow by a couple of percent in 2023. And so Ukraine's GDP has gone down 30 to 40 percent, isn't that right? Uh, that's correct. Uh, Ukraine's GDP is now about uh, 120 billion from a pre-war 200 billion. Considering that the reconstruction costs are estimated at anywhere from 300 billion to a trillion dollars. Basically, it means it's a wreck of a country. No one's ever come up with several times a country's GDP to reconstruct it. And what's happened to Ukraine itself is horrifying. Before the war, the population on paper was about 43 million. Maybe they had 33 million people living in the country because so many had moved abroad, were working abroad. Now we have an additional 8, 10 million refugees. So the number of actual Ukrainian residents is somewhere in the low 20 millions. The country, in other words, is a bit over half the size of its estimated population before the war, not counting people working overseas. Its uh, infrastructure is ruined. Its economy is ruined. There's really nothing left. It's living on an iron lung, so to speak, provided by the West. And Russia shows no sign of really diminishing militarily. 
Russia has Wait, before managed we go to into Europe. Russia for a second, the thing with Ukraine that I think is important with the attrition is that uh, it's not only Ukraine that's being attrited with depopulation and the destruction of its economy, it's also the West that's being attrited because I think I saw the data point that the amount of that it would take America 13 years to replenish its arsenals to the point that they were at before the Russian invasion, that the United States is not the arsenal of 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 uh, democracies as it became during World War II, but rather it had stores that it was transferring to Ukraine, but it's depleting them and it didn't expand its production so that without a significant uh, expansion of, of U.S. production of, you know, the high Mars and the javelins and the, and all of the other munitions that the United States is, is transferring to Ukraine, um, it's going to run out of things to give them. And even, you know, I, I think the point was made that even the tanks that the United States is now promising, well, how do you, you don't just give somebody a tank. They have to not only be trained to manage them, but they also have to have mechanics who are capable and spare parts in Ukraine, because you you bring a tank into battle, you get twenty, you get a you get a battalion of tanks, you put it into battle, you know, and then they're out of commission within a week or so of of battle. So that this is not actually, I mean, it's like giving them disposable diapers if you're not, you know, they're they they're just they're 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 one 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 time use of these tanks if you don't have the capacity to maintain them and. That takes time to build up. And again, so I'm looking before we even move to Russia. I mean, it, the war of attrition is not working either to Ukraine's benefit or to the benefit of, of NATO. Isn't that true? Well, the NATO anthem could well be, yes, we have no bananas. Uh, NATO was promised, uh, NATO promised Ukraine 300 tanks, which, you know, it's, that's, in that theater, that kind of makes a difference. It's not the 3,000 tanks that fought in the Battle of Kursk on each side, but it's still substantial. Only 50 of those are likely to be available by the end of April. Um, many of them will never be. So a tenth. Uh, the Abrams tanks uh, probably won't be available till next year. And as you point out, uh, the amount of logistics required to maintain the Abrams tanks, which are very sensitive items. They, they use a jet engine as opposed to an ordinary internal combustion engine or diesel engine. Uh, the U.S. was reluctant to grant them because they're simply too logistics intensive to be used effectively. Uh, let me throw out one number. You mentioned uh, uh, ammunition. Russia is estimated to produce anywhere between 9,000 and 15,000 artillery shells a day. The 9,000 estimate is Estonian. I've heard from Russian sources 15,000. So in that range, the United States produces 15,000 artillery shells a month. Throw in all the rest of NATO and we might get up to 30,000. So Russia's production of artillery shells, which is the working ammunition of day-to-day -day battle uh, in uh, the line, across the line of contact is an order of magnitude higher than that of the West. Now, of course, we could build more factories, but we haven't. Uh, there was a proposal to give the Ukrainians um, a long-range missile called Attackums. That was scuppered because it turns out we haven't produced that missile since 2007. There are only 3,000 projectiles left in inventory from 2007. Some of them might even fire today. Uh, Javelins, pretty, the ammunition's pretty much expended. High Mars, you have one for every 15 or 20 miles of front. It doesn't do very much, and they're running out of ammunition. So ammunition shortages, as the Ukrainian government has said itself, are a significant danger to Ukrainians' ability to continue fighting. Now, Ukraine mobilized its entire military manpower, unlike Russia. It basically put a million men under arms. Uh, it 
literally took people off the streets and put them in a uniform. Uh, they've lost um, between 150, 100 and 150,000 men. Whether they could sustain the loss of yet another 100,000 is not clear. In a war of attrition, the big numbers win just by arithmetic. The Russians and Ukrainians are both stolid and dogged fighters. They're both Russians, basically. All the Ukra senior Ukrainian officers served in the Russian army. It's like two groups of Russians fighting each other, and the Russians you know, may complain, but they get their orders, and they pick up a rifle, and they do what they're told. They follow orders. So neither side are cowards. Neither side are flagging. But the grinding World War I style battle across the line of contact in eastern Ukraine is killing perhaps a hundred soldiers a day or more on each side. And eventually, barring some other development, Russia is very likely to win this one because Ukraine will simply run out of soldiers and ammunition. Whoever got us into this war, I should say the Biden administration, didn't bother to think of the consequences of a long-term war for which we were absolutely unprepared. It was an act of incredible stupidity, thoughtlessness, and lack of foresight, lack of planning. And we're stuck with it. And the more we get into a hole, the more you have uh, U.S. senior officials insisting Russia's lost. It's the end. You know, we just have to give them a bit more material. We're going to win. Uh, and they all know it's not true. They're just simply lying about it. So, I mean, it seems to me that under the circumstances, right, the 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 only way out uh, is a negotiated solution. But um, what do you look at the prospects of that happening now, um, from the Russian perspective and from the American perspective, and and Ukraine, of course rejects all compromise, right? They want to get all of their territory back, including the territory that, that Putin gobbled up in, in 2014. Naftali Bennett, as you know, gave an interview to Israeli television a week before last in which he said he had gone to Moscow, he talked to Putin, he had the basis for a negotiated peace in hand. He came back and he was sandbagged by the United States. They decided they didn't want it. This is March of last year. So there was a point at which it was possible. None of these outcomes is any good, Karen. We provoked Putin, but that doesn't excuse what Putin did. Everyone from Henry Kissinger to William Burns, now CIA director, ambassador to Moscow 10 years ago, warned that bringing Ukraine into NATO was a red line. That brought the prospect, at least, of NATO missiles up to with, within a few hundred kilometers of Moscow, and the Russians were not going to take it. And the Russians were also not going to accept the uh, trampling over the rights of former Russian citizens, Russian speakers in eastern Ukraine, whom they consider still citizens of the Russian Federation. So by ignoring the possibility of a compromise in Ukraine, which is a neutral Ukraine, would keep the Russian-speaking areas with a certain amount of autonomy within a sovereign Ukraine. That was the Minsk II deal. By ignoring that, uh, we offered a red flag in front of the bull. We provoked Putin. Putin's invasion of Ukraine was brutal and illegal. It's not defensible. But if we have a negotiated solution now where Putin remains in place in the areas that the Russian Federation has declared that it annexed from Ukraine, Putin has won politically, and that is a severe humiliation of the West, humiliation of NATO. That's a predicament we got ourselves into. And we may have to suffer that humiliation because the consequences might be an even worse humiliation. Right now, as the Russians put it, we're fighting to the last Ukrainian. It's cheap and easy for us. And you hear U.S. military analysts say all the time, well, $50 billion, $50 billion for Ukraine. Yeah, it's expensive, but we're degrading an opponent and we're not expending any American lives. What a great deal that is. Well, the cynicism How cynical. of that kind of view, 
uh, and you hear it all the time. I'll quote names if you want. Uh, I find disgusting and, in fact, wicked because we've destroyed, not just killed hundreds of thousands of people, we've ruined the lives of 10 million people who've been torn from their homes and another 20 million whose lives have become immiserated, dangerous, and frightening and poor. We have no right to do that to other countries, no right to use them as cannon fodder for our ambitions. Now, the question is, why do we do it? What, what's the ambition? Well, the liberal internationalist side of the Democratic Party, the neocon Democrats, so to speak, have looked at Vladimir, Vladimir Putin the way um, Captain Ahab looked at Moby Dick for years. Victoria Newland, now Under Secretary for Policy at the State Department, in 2014, a head of Eastern Europe desk at the State Department, has wanted regime change in Russia for 10 years and bragged about it openly. That's her goal. The Hudson Institute just had a conference preparing for the dissolution of the Russian Federation. There are a lot of American strategists who think that the breaking up Russia as a country, letting all of the constituent parts break up into different little statelets run by various jihadists in the south of Russia, would be a good thing. Now, I personally don't think that would be a good thing. I don't think it's a good idea for countries with massive nuclear arsenals to fall apart. But that is a view, at least on the part of a significant part of the U.S. foreign policy establishment. And that was the motivation for this war. But, it, I mean, it's also a fantasy because, I mean, at least as, according to the polls that are coming out of Russia, Putin is more popular than ever now. I mean, he, he, he well, his course, Russian he, people he, are standing behind their leader. The average Russian believes that this is a Western war to destroy Russia. Now, that may not be the view of everyone in the West, but it's certainly the view of many prominent people in the West. Well, I mean, you so, just described uh, you just described a Hudson Institute conference uh, essentially declaring that they're correct to, to, to think that. And all of that's going to be blared back through Russian propaganda. That's what the Russians are going to read. And it's not entirely invented. A uh, paranoid Russian may be a pleonasm. All Russians are paranoid, but even paranoids have real enemies. So we have now put Russia into a spot. We've said, Kamala Harris said this at the Munich conference uh, over the weekend. Russia's guilty of crimes against humanity, of war crimes, which means that we're treating the Russians the way we treated Hitler. There's no so political saying, solution. Just, just to get, just to get to 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 the point, because I want to, I want to uh, touch on a couple of other issues. But you're saying right now that America and and Russia and uh, Kiev and NATO are losing the war of attrition because it's, I mean, just on the basis of supply, the, the United States cannot continue to supply the Ukraine war effort at the speed and to the extent that's required in order to keep keep fighting over time, the Russians okay. are going to outproduce the Americans and, uh, you know, bring in more drug addicts or whatever to be their cannon fodder. I mean, they emptied out their jails, right? So, because that was another thing that the Americans were saying, right? That, that, that the Russian army was getting depleted and look here, the Wagner group is being brought in and they're all mercenaries and, and criminals being uh, uh, commanded by by mercenaries uh, and therefore uh, Russia is going to run out of uh, troops before Ukraine does. Well, Russia is not running out of troops. Russia successfully mobilized. So there was some evasion. Some people left Russia. There was a bit of immigration. But for the most part, the Russians follow orders the same way the Ukrainians do. They're very similar peoples. They used to be part of the Soviet Union. They're not that different. So two things can happen. One is uh, Ukraine loses the war of attrition by degrees, and eventually there's a ceasefire. It could be like a North Korea, South Korea ceasefire, which is uh, armistice with no peace. It could be a negotiated peace. There are any number of variants. That's one set of alternatives. The other is... As Ukraine 
loses, NATO, specifically the United States, decides to intervene on the Ukrainian side in one way or another. That could take many forms. I don't think we're going to send in the 101st Airborne. People have talked about that. It's nonsense. We don't have the logistics to support an American expedition. There, I don't think there's any public support for that in the United States. No, I don't think so. And remember, the 101st Airborne uh, of glorious history hasn't done anything but fight goat herds for a long time. They haven't fought a peer combatant uh, since World War II. So you know, who knows how good they'd be. But we could send in American air power to attack the Russians. We could give the Ukrainians long-range rockets and artillery and destroy Russian infrastructure deep inside Russia. We could do what we could attack Russia's Black Fleet, sink Russian ships. There, if the United States responds to the prospect of Ukrainian defeat by getting involved directly, we're already involved indirectly in many ways, but if we get involved directly, then we've got the prospect of a war between Russia and the United States. Now, the American government says repeatedly, Russia won't use nuclear weapons, why Putin would be a pariah. Um, you know, it would never happen. In the event that the United States used what still is formidable air and other power to try to defeat Russia, the use of nuclear weapons becomes a serious possibility. And then well, the, Russians have, have been, the Russians have been threatening nuclear use of tactical nuclear weapons since the opening months of the war, right? Well, remember, Russia has about 2,000 small nuclear weapons, like one kiloton. One kiloton is the equivalent of 2,000 of the big cruise missiles they use to attack Ukraine's electricity infrastructure. It's, no, it's, it's a small nuclear weapon, but it's a very, very big bomb. As a thought experiment, suppose Russia says tomorrow, please evacuate the following coal-fired nuclear plant in western Ukraine because tomorrow at 2.30 p.m. we're going to drop a nuclear weapon on it. And then they do it. What do we do then? Uh, the, that would take so us into. If we, if we take the two scenarios, then, you know, the scenario of partitioning Ukraine makes more sense from a global security perspective. Um, and then, you know, maybe the way to handle it would be for the EU to accept as a member that partitioned Ukraine. And then they get to be part of Europe so that they have a political victory, but they're not part of NATO, and you didn't expand the war. Expanding the war is the worst possible alternative because it threatens uh, a nuclear war. war. That, that would be a catastrophe. There, once you agree to have a ceasefire, then you can be, begin to negotiate things to compensate for the Ukrainians for lost territory. The Donbass is 70%, 80% of uh, Ukraine's industry, so it would be a significant loss. Uh, the problem is at the fact that we stupidly provoked Putin into a brutal and illegal act, which we cannot stop him, we, we cannot reverse. We don't have the physical means to do it unless we widen the war. And that brings up a whole set of other strategic possibilities, uh, risks that we've never confronted before and certainly haven't thought through. And what worries me is that the uh, global liberals who got us into this mess, in order to save their reputations and their vision of a global democratic rules-based order unencumbered by troglodytes like Vladimir Putin will risk a strategic catastrophe rather than be humiliated. That would not be the first time in history that military leaders did that. But you know, that's the thing that, you know, I, I, if we talk about how this war has impacted the United States and its global standing, I mean, one of the things that's most uh, notable about the behavior of the Biden administration over the past year in relation to Ukraine and it, is that it's so similar 
to its helter-skelter withdrawal from Afghanistan in the sense that there seems to be no forethought uh, of, and certainly no strategic concept that they're advancing here so that, oh, well, you know, let's go to war against Putin. Let, oh, this is this will not stand, but okay, so why don't you count to 10 and while you're counting, sit down and think about, you know, a strategic concept and an, and, and an objective that's achievable given your means, uh, your capacities, and what you're willing and, you know, how you want to come out of it. And there's no, no, no sense in the United States that that's what's happened. They keep going back to Congress, getting another 50 billion and another 25 billion in aid to Ukraine. You know they're 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 depleting stores, emergency stores of of of, uh, of weapons in Israel that are supposed to serve Israel in time of war. They're getting depleted, and I don't actually think that, despite the hostility of the administration towards Israel, I don't think that this is an anti-Israel action. I think they just don't have any better options, and so they're yeah. depleting also all of their munition China. stores. So yeah. I mean, what also I'm saying China. is, that to me. It's devastating for the United States. They, they, this is another policy that the, Joe, Joe Biden likes to scream and yell a lot. It's, it's like a tantrum. It's like they go in and they throw everything at, at Ukraine, and then the Ukrainian. I, I mean, maybe they didn't think that Ukraine was going to fight. They seem to have thought that they were going to collapse, just as Putin apparently expected that they were going to collapse within the first seventy-two hours. They offered Zelensky a ride out of Kiev to to exile. And, you know, I don't know, maybe they, they, they thought that this would be a, a guerrilla war and they would be able to fund this with light arms or something like that. But that's not the war that they got. And then instead of sitting back and, and thinking it through, they just kept throwing stuff at the Ukrainians, which they're continuing to do. I mean, Joe Biden landing in Ukraine, how symbolic, a year in, how nice. Again, where's the strategy? What is the strategic goal? Not only that you want to pursue, but that you're capable of actually accomplishing. And this, to me, is devastating for the U.S. reputation as a global superpower. Consider another dimension. At the beginning of the war, the Biden administration said that sanctions would cut the size of the Russian economy in half, destroy its ability to make war forever. And it went down 3%, you said, right? Instead... World trade and finance reformed itself, reshaped itself to get around American sanctions. India became a huge customer for Russian oil for the first time because they got a discount. Chinese bought a great deal more Russian oil. Uh, Russia was able to import anything at once because world trade is a very complex net and China or India or other places would export to Turkey, Armenia, Georgia, Kazakhstan, and somehow this would find its way to Russia in undocumented trade flows. So Russia has had no problem sourcing what it needs, either for civilian or military consumption. The whole of the global South, Brazil, India, Mexico, Africa, voted against the sanctions at the United Nations, refused to participate. So as far as most of the world is concerned, this is an American war they want nothing to do with. That's already cost us enormously. And you know, if, if you look at the depletion of stockpiles, not just Israel, imagine if you're South Korea and you're looking at North We're Korea. With its, their, their stockpiles are being depleted as well. And they're facing, what, 15,000 North Korean artillery tubes pointed at them. And suddenly their ammunition's being removed. Yeah, also. America Excuse me. Completed its weapons stores in South Korea as well. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. That does wonders for our standing in Asia, for the confidence that Asians have that will defend them, and from the standpoint of Taiwan, which looks at uh, Ukraine being destroyed, uh, they will remember well the words of Henry Kissinger that it's often dangerous to be an enemy of the United States, but it's fatal to be our friend. So yes, this war has the incompetence and uh, blindness of our leaders that you referred to has vastly diminished America's standing. 
And there's no way to get out of it without taking a hit. That hit's already done. The question is, how do we minimize the hit? What's the least bad of a bunch of bad alternatives? A negotiated peace is the least bad. Escalating the war is by far the worst. So let's go for a second from, from the United States. Um, for, first, let's go to NATO. Uh, you know, there, like I think you mentioned, you know, if, if, if the United States weren't helping Ukraine or if the United States stopped helping Ukraine, that that would, and even now, that if they get to a, some sort of a negotiated solution or agreement with Russia that leaves Russia in control over the Donbass, uh, and obviously of Crimea, um, that that would essentially be the end of NATO. Why, why is that? I mean, NATO, you know, says has, has uh, even if they're not doing well, they are doing badly together. You know, I mean, there there is a sense that NATO is actually showing that it may not be a successful nuclear military organization, but it's certainly a new, uh, military organization. I mean, it is an alliance. Yeah. In, in 1989, before communism fell, Germany had 12 divisions, uh, I believe 3,000 main battle tanks. Uh, it was a formidable fighting force. They were well-armed and well-trained. Now it has uh, perhaps a fifth of that, and they're virtually disarmed. They may have 100 functional tanks. Germany might be able to scramble four to six fighters in the air at any given time. Four to six. Yeah, four to six Eurofighters. So this, the Europeans, after the fall of communism, decided they didn't have to fight anymore. They got rid of the draft in Germany. Uh, they don't want to fight. And if all that's happened is once Putin said boo, you know, then moved into Ukraine, out of absolute terror, they all hid behind the skirts of the United States. They're not doing any fighting. They're sending relatively modest amounts of material. They don't have very much material to send. They're selling modest amounts of aid. So they're a rabble of cowards who've given well, up on their own. What happened, for instance, to Sweden and Finland that suddenly joined NATO, and this was seen as a great achievement no, that the no, Finns no, and the Swedes joined NATO? Uh, Finland and the Swedes and Finns are different. The Finns have a militia system, a reserve with uh, 400,000 soldiers who are reasonably well-trained. The Russians fought them in uh, 1940 and had a very bad experience and don't want to do it again. The Finns are tough and the Russians aren't going to mess with them. The Swedes are also tough when they have to be, although the Swedish military is not what it used to be. So yes, everyone rallied against Putin who did commit a crime in invading Ukraine. Uh, there's no, no question about it. But since the Europeans don't want to fight themselves, they're content to let the Ukrainians do their dying for them uh, and let the United States provide most of the money. So you know, they're sitting there on the side, uh, feckless and useless. So, you know, that's NATO. For what it's worth. So let's move further afield. Um, one of the things that was strengthened, one alliance that was strengthened significantly by the war in Ukraine is Russia's alliance with Iran. And um, and now it's not only that Russia is assisting Iran in uh, nuclear development, which the United States just insanely waived sanctions over uh, a week and a half ago, but Iran is is supplying Russia with these killer drones, one of which was used against an, an Israeli-owned tanker in the Persian Gulf uh, 10 days ago. But they're using these killer drones uh, to great effect. And um, Russia is starting to supply Iran not only with nuclear assistance, and, and we'll talk about this maybe uh, towards the end, of that, that Iran just... Uh, they're, they're weapons grade. I mean, they have 80, somebody found, uh, IAEA inspectors found enriched uranium to 84%. And so, okay, we get it. Um, and so, you know, Russia is now supplying uh, Iran with uh, advanced, uh, weapon, advanced fighter jets. I don't know how long it'll take them to learn how to use them, but uh, that's a big deal. 
you know, then they may end up yes. using significant uh, anti-aircraft uh, batteries like S400s uh, over Tehran instead of S300s. Um, these, these are big, big deals for Israel and for the Gulf states. Um, that, no, this, that's this profound. Is, this and the United is, States this, on the hand is depleting Israel's uh, emergency munition stores to to fight this war of attrition in, in Ukraine, which they're they're losing. Look, as you know, the uh, Iranians have a very significant number of highly trained technical people. They've got very good electrical engineers and others. Uh, the, the IDF has never underestimated them. They're smart and tough. The one thing they've never had access to is modern military aircraft, not since the uh, Iran-Iraq war, certainly not since the 1979 revolution. And now that Russia is going to sell them Su-35s. Su-35 is a very good plane. It's comparable to the F uh, F-15s that uh, Israel flies. Whether the avionics are as good is doubtful, but nonetheless, it's an extremely good plane. So this will be the first time that Iran has had a modern air capability that can compete with the Gulf states, uh, let alone Israel, and it's extremely dangerous. Now, in 2008, I wrote a Spengler essay for Asia Times saying we've got a choice between Ukraine and Iran. We have no strategic interest in Ukraine. We don't need it for anything. It can be neutral. If we strike a deal back then with uh, Russia over Ukraine, we can get Russia's cooperation dealing with Iran, which is a much bigger threat to the United States. We're there we have a real strategic interest because of the impact on the Gulf states as well as Israel. We made the other choice. We decided to put all our chips on Ukraine where we have no strategic interest, which gives the Russians an incentive to ally with whatever enemies of ours they can as it suits them. So exactly as you say, we now have the prospect of Iran acquiring sophisticated modern <coughs> modern arms. The drones are a pain in the neck, but the SD-35s are a real threat, as are the anti-missile systems. So yes, we made a catastrophic error. We chose, we went through the wrong door. And that's a, a significant strategic risk for Israel. So it, it, this is an Israeli show. Um, what would you be advising uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, Strategic Affairs uh, Minister Ron Dermer, when you're looking at the dumpster fire, which is America's reputation as a superpower, not to mention the smoldering ember of Ukraine. I mean, and, and you're seeing this supply, uh, the, this this burgeoning military alliance. I mean, it's a partnership. The Iranians give Russia stuff, and they're giving the Iranians stuff. I, I would urge them to study carefully Yeremiyahu, the prophet Jeremiah. Don't bet on Egypt versus Babylon. Uh, Israel is caught between. Three major That's exactly problems. You saw that Tony Badran wrote that about uh, Hezekiah uh, in uh, Hezekiah in the uh, tablet last week also. The, um, no, actually, I didn't read Tony's article. Tony That's Badran said All of you guys should read it. It's good. The, uh, there are three powers involved here. The United States, Russia, and China. The United States is a friend and ally of Israel, but is not acting in Israel's interests out of stupidity and short-sightedness. It's doing things that harm Israel's interests. Russia is no friend of Israel, but neither an enemy. And Netanyahu, to his enormous credit, managed to establish reasonably cordial working relations with Russia to deal with Syria and Iranian in infiltration into Syria. Russians gave the idea of a free hand after Russia moved in in 2016. And then there's China, which is in the background. China uh, is not uh, a forward-deploying military power like the Russians. 
To my knowledge, there are exactly 200 Chinese soldiers forward deployed. There are Marines cooling their hills in Djibouti, which is the one Chinese base. China is extremely cautious about having any kind of military role in Western Asia. Uh, they're not set up for it. They don't have the forces for it. But they have enormous soft power, economic influence. Uh, it is very mildly encouraging, and I say very mildly, that last December, uh, uh, when Xi Jinping went to uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, China signed a joint declaration with the Gulf Coordinating Council, criticizing Iran for sponsoring terrorism and destabilizing the region, along with the Saudis. Now, of course, they just had the Iranians on a state visit to Beijing, and it's all hugs and kisses again. But nonetheless, that is a man bites dog story. It's the first time they publicly criticized the Iranians. So Israel is going to have to try to give its best counsel to its friend and ally, the United States, uh, not encourage it in uh, a policy that's harmful to the United States. And by not encourage it, do not provide weapons to Ukraine. Humanitarian help is fine, but don't give the Iron you, Dome or other weapons. You're pressuring to Israel very, very harshly to give them Iron Dome and now David Sling. Uh, I, I would refuse that. I would stay as far from that conflict as possible. There's no possible, nothing good can come of that, of that for Israel. Israel should do its best diplomatically to maintain good relations with Iran and with China without in not any way... Iran, not with Iran, with Russia. With Sorry, with Russia and China. Do its best to maintain relations with Russia and China. Just as Netanyahu did in the past. The United States was at daggers drawn with Russia over Syria, but uh, Israel still managed to have excellent relations with Iran while being a loyal ally of the United States. And uh, China's role in the region will grow, and Israel will have to diplomatically engage China in ways that I couldn't possibly predict, because that's a, uh, that's a moving target. It's a story that's uh, only developing. It's a very difficult situation for Israel to be in, and I'm personally glad that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu is the prime minister because he's shown uh, an extraordinary ability to manage such difficulties in the past. You know, it's one of the things that's both encouraging and discouraging to me at the same time is um, there were reports this week, and, and really they're, they're true, uh, regardless of whether they're being reported or not, of expanding Israeli-Saudi ties or discussions, uh, sh sharing of information uh, as Iran becomes more openly a nuclear power, which is good. I mean, and, and the reports that came out, I think it was Bloomberg, that the Americans are trying to claim authorship of this, which is, of course, untrue because the, the Biden administration is anti-Saudi and anti-Israel. So whatever the case, um, an alliance, official or unofficial, between Israel and Saudi Arabia, what would be the implications for Russia? What would be the implications for China? And then lastly, of course, for Iran, as you see it. Well, there's one other element of the equation that we have to talk about, the largest military power in Western Asia, namely Turkey. Turkey, of course, was openly hostile to Israel withdrew its ambassador in protest over America's recognition of Jerusalem as the capital and the move of America's embassy to Jerusalem. Uh, very difficult relations after the, um, uh, the Gaza fleet, you know, tried to break the blockade 10 years, yeah, 10 years ago. So as you know, of course, uh, Israel and uh, Turkey have now exchanged ambassadors. Uh, Herzog was just in Turkey. Uh, there are, you know, pr fruitful discussions. Uh, Israel, Israel aircraft had industry. the second largest delegation in earthquake relief to, to Turkey. They had to leave early, from what I understand, because there were direct threats to attack the delegation. But, um, you know, Israel oh, was they're, 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 number two after Uzbekistan or something in aid to the Turkish. Uh, no, there, uh, there are many years of cooperation. Israel aircraft industries refurbished the old phantom jets that the Turkish Air Force still flies and you know, upgraded their avionics. So clearly what the Gulf states would like to see 
is a Turkey that gives up its hegemonic neo-Ottoman ambitions in the region and becomes a stabilizing power and maintains good relations with both the Gulf states and Israel, that would be a counterweight to Iran. Uh, China has put an enormous amount of effort into building up the Turkish economy. China's exports to Turkey have tripled in the last three years. And Turkey, of course, is the most important intermediary between Russia and the rest of the world. It's uh, been the main bridge over the seasons. So you're seeing a geopolitical shift where Turkey, uh, you know, Erdogan decided to be the neo-Ottoman uh, marcher lord of the region and went broke. The economy nearly disintegrated, the currency collapsed. 2000, 2021. Then he went to the Gulf states and said, look, I'm giving it up. I'm going to behave myself. The, the UAE gave him $10 billion last year. Chinese gave him a huge amount of trade credits. We don't know exactly how much, but we can see the exports. So if Erdogan decides to cash in the chips he built up, the blackmail capacity that he's had against his neighbors in return for prosperity, economic strength, and military strength, it's possible that Turkey could once again be a stabilizing force in the region and a counterweight to Iran. So there are many variables here, more than I can imagine and more scenarios that I could possibly envision. Uh, I think Israel has an enormously difficult diplomatic challenge to try to maneuver between all of these, uh, you know, between Scylla and Charybdis, so to speak. Uh, with so many risks, but also the possibility of new alliances and new friends. The Abraham Accords are a great development, and that could be a bridge to Turkey, for example. China you know, is no. You point know, let me just let me just add a little bit of of uh, a, a few flies into your your ointment. Um, you know, I was I was really disappointed to see that the UAE was acting as a vehicle for the Palestinians to push their latest anti-Israel resolution in the UN Security Council. And, and granted that the Biden administration pushed back and it ended up becoming just a very anti-Israel declaration of the UN Security Council and not a resolution. It wasn't brought for a vote. But if the UAE is Israel's partner, then why are they advancing this? And then, and then you take that where you have these these very not friendly actions being taken by Israel's new partners add to that, that anti-Israelism is like the new new black, you know, it's, it's the new uh, anti-Vietnam war or pro-Sandinista anti-Contra thing for the international left. I mean, it, it's like, you know, I'm a progressive, I hate Israel. And you hear even people like Joe Rogan just sort of blithely stating these anti-Semitic lies and getting a good laugh. And it's becoming anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, hatred for Israel, rejection of Israel's legitimacy as a, as a political entity is becoming more and more mainstream in, in the well, life. This is, in yes, the this is, this so you're at, you, I mean, like that is also part of the mix, right? So Israel tries to normalize its relations with Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is demonized by the left and um, Saudi Arabia is pushed away from Israel by the global left that's demonizing Israel and saying the most important people in the entire world are Palestinian terrorists. So in- We have to confront the possibility that a demo future democratic administration might turn away from Israel. If you look at the poll numbers, the Democratic Party is about 50% anti-Israel now. Democratic foreign policy establishment still treats Israel as an ally. It's very hard not to because since the United States doesn't want to put boots on the ground in the Middle East, and Israel is the most powerful military force in the Middle East, uh, the United States does need Israel as an ally more than ever. So there's an institutional military relationship, which is hard to break. But the politics are going the other direction. Now, hopefully, I say hopefully, we'll have a Republican administration in a couple of years. The Republicans are overwhelmingly pro-Israel, and that issue uh, will be in abeyance. But 
Israel cannot count on anything for certain. And that's why it's extremely important not to make, Israel will never be a friend of China. China has no friends. Uh, it'll never be a friend of Russia, but it's important to look for areas of commonality of agreement. There's a basic interest that China has in Western Asia. It wants Persian Gulf oil. It doesn't want Iran to blow up Saudi Arabia. That would hurt the Chinese economy. So China, uh, although it's guilty of many reprehensible things, is a stabilizing force as far as Western Asia is concerned. Now, how it chooses to go about that, I very much doubt the Chinese have figured it out because that's never been a priority. They've always had the knee-jerk, third-worldist, anti-imperialist, anti-Israel diplomatic view. Uh, but China's policy is evolving. I heard. A I want to ask Chinese you one last question. I want to interrupt you and your and your answer here because because we don't have a lot of time left, and I want to ask you one last question. When you talk about China and you know their knee jerk third worldism, it reminded me of another question that I jotted down when you were talking about Turkey, which is the role of ideology in all of this, right? Because I mean. Turkey was a fantastic strategic ally for Israel until 2002 when Erdogan and his Islamist party came into power for the first time. And over the subsequent 21 years, uh, they have, you know, the, uh, their jihadist ideology has played a major role in all of their decision making. And when you look at China, you know, the, you know there are many things but one thing that they are is communist, and they are motivated by that ideology. I think, and I mean, I I don't see any evidence contrary to that. And so, like, one of the the glue, if you will, behind the Abraham Accords, as I see it, is that after the Arab Spring, you had these status quo Arab powers, monarchies president, you know, uh, uh, perpetual presidencies or what have you that turned away from jihad and the Muslim Brotherhood because they suddenly realized that they would come and bite them just like they overthrew Mubarak. And so they became anti-ideological, but then you have these other powers that have not. And so I don't, I mean, the, the ability to, 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 to trust or to build something with with Turkey, it would seem to me, is is limited by the influence and the power that jihadist ideology continues to hold on the regime. No. Well, that this is this is an enormous question, Mark Carroll, and your point is exactly correct. Erdogan has got to make a choice between being the leader of a nation state and pursuing the interests of that nation state and being an ideological leader. He has an ideological ambition to make Turkey the leader of the Muslim world, that so-called neo-Ottomanism, which puts him at odds with the Saudis. And he's used the Muslim Brotherhood as an instrument to threaten the Gulf states and blackmail them. He's allied with Qatar, which is the main financial sponsor of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, uh, Which is so, all ideological. I mean, Qatar is an ideological principality. That's what they... they yes. Jihad. So we, we do not know which way Erdogan will go. But it is not impossible that he'll decide that it's in his best interest to be the leader of a strong and robust nation state as opposed to an ideological spoiler with all the nasty consequences. He tried that and nearly got his head handed to it. China is the most, the Chinese are the most pragmatic people in the world. They're more communist and at an average Midwestern university than there are in all of Beijing. You um, don't think I that Xi is a communist? She's, uh, she is a Faustian. Uh, he told Angela Merkel that his, the, the, his favorite book was Goethe's Faust and he knew it by heart. That's also frightening, by the way, it's in its terrifying. own way. Yes, that is terrifying. He's a risk taker. He's incredibly ambitious. He's a Faustian personality. 
But I don't think uh, there are, yeah, there are a lot of people at the foreign ministry who have their ideological reflexes. But I also heard a top Chinese diplomat say at a closed door session organized by an Israeli think tank under Chatham House rules, there is no more Arab Israeli problem. Israel's made peace with all its neighbors from our standpoint. That thing is gone and the Palestinians should just shut up. So there are other people who've got a much more pragmatic view. My, my perception of China, having spent you know, a dozen years on the board of a Sino-Israeli foundation that does Chinese-Israeli relations, Chinese don't know what they want to do in Western Asia. They're trying to figure it out. A bunch of crazy barbarians killing each other when all they want is for everyone to sit down and make money and pay taxes, pay tribute to the emperor. So very hard to read the future. I, I believe Israel should be flexible, pragmatic, and try to engage all sides in a rapidly I, changing. I, I mean, I think that, you know, when I was in grad school, I had this professor who was talking about, um, you know, how nations have to make decisions. And one of the things that he talked about was making safe bets. What is a safe bet that you can make in a risky, dynamic situation? And every time I look at the situation, you know, I say, what are what are safe bets for Israel here? And the safest bet for Israel is strategic independence. So it's diminishing the reliance on the United States to the level, to the minimum level necessary, uh, but to have the strategic objective of having the supply line for our munitions in Israel and to and to just become as powerful as we possibly can. And we've gotten this far because, you know, we, we, we've got to the Abraham Accords because we were, we are powerful. And so the safest bet for Israel is just both economically and militarily to, to develop independent strategic capacities. And, you know, everything else is, is reliant on that. Everything else is, is a function of that. And, uh, I don't know what's going to happen with Iran. That's the truth. I, I don't. And 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 now I'm to go back at the end to where we began. You know, a year ago, uh, we were gaming this out. You were writing very prescient articles that were simply based on 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 how Putin viewed Ukraine and and what capabilities NATO could bring to bear. And you you foresaw exactly what has transpired. So looking forward with your really encyclopedic knowledge of the capabilities of many, many actors on the global stage, where do you see, I'll have, you know, 50 shows from now, I'll have another show with you, hopefully before that as well. But, you know, where, if you, where based on where we are today, where do you think we're gonna be a year out? Well, a year from now, I think uh, the Ukraine war will be over. Uh, there will be a North Korea, South Korea kind of peace. Uh, Ukraine will be in ruins. It'll take decades, if ever, before that country recovers. So it'll be a, a tragic reminder of the co human costs of diplomatic and military stupidity. I believe that Russia will be much more oriented towards Asia economically. China is going to be a dominant force in the global south, um, particularly in Southeast Asia. More world trade flows, more manufacturing and technology will revolve around China. Uh, and China's role in Western Asia will have expanded considerably. Uh, that may not be the Pax Sinica, about which I speculated years ago. Uh, but in the best case, it will be uh, a stabilizing force, simply out of naked Chinese self-interest. They need the energy, they don't want a war in Western Asia. So that's the best case scenario. The worst case scenario is we have a confrontation between the United States and Russia and terrible consequences, God forbid. All right, well, on that happy note, <laughs> Um, I, I think we're going to have to end it, but I thank you so much for joining me and sharing uh, your thoughts with me. Well, and sure. uh, with well, Carolyn, it's Carolyn. always a pleasure to talk to you, even about depressing things. Well, you know, we, we certainly are in a fine pickle. <laughs>
uh, because people aren't thinking things through. And I think one of the reasons that I do this show is to try to think things through so that at least all of my growing viewers and listeners, agree, you know, you can all think it through with me because if, if we don't understand this world, then we're definitely not going to make good decisions uh, as nations or governments uh, in terms of how to uh, how to move forward successfully in it. So yeah, in, in, in these bitterly uh, frustrating times, I think having David Goldman come as a guest on the Carolyn Glick show is absolutely necessary. So thank you for again for coming. Uh, I appreciate it very much. And next week I'll be back uh, in uh, Jerusalem filming again from uh, JNS Studios. So Thank you, guys, and we will see you uh, next week. Mm -hmm.